thanks for coming this afternoon or morning, whatever the hell it is. Uh, it's uh, it's my second in-person conference uh, since COVID. Anyone? This your first? Multiple? Yeah. Uh, I did B-Sides KC a few weeks back, and I, I will say it was a little different. Um, some of the content was a little old, but that's fine. Um, it was nice to be back in front of people. So uh, today I want to talk about comparing WAF and RASP uh, and why we're doing it uh, with a really big question mark. Uh, I'm curious. Who here is managing WAF, RASP, or using them in their orgs that they know of one? OK. And what is a RASP? Raise your hands. What is a RASP? We'll get there, I promise. Uh, so let's, let's dig in. Uh, so that's me. Uh, I'm David Linder. I'm the CISO at Contrast Security. Uh, Twitter, Golf Hacker Dave. Um, dad, I try to golf. Um, really into Iowa Hawkeyes, fishing, things like that. Uh, I've been in AppSec most of my career, uh, spent most of it in consulting, uh, at, at Aspect Security back in the day before they were uh, acquired. Um, and uh, it's been nice to kind of get out of consulting for a while, I'll tell you that. So not so breaking news. Applications are vulnerable and they're under attack. I think all of us here understand that. They have been for years. Um, but I think we have to keep hearing it. Uh, and it's always good to, to, to relook at things. So before we dig into uh, WAF and RASP and you know how they each work and you know maybe compare them a little bit, I wanted to break down the the story a little bit and and look at applications and you know and I know you've probably heard Jeff even this morning in the keynote was talking about you know the composition of apps and things like that, um, but I think it's really important to understand some of these things. So I want to dig in a little bit. Um, so the 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 normal application code makeup is about 20% of custom code. 6% um, active open source libraries, so that's, you know, that's very small. 49% uh, are inactive open source libraries, and 25% are active libraries, uh, but plenty of classes that aren't even invoked in those libraries. So it gets very complex, but forever we've been like, oh, hey, you have a CVE, and you're using this library that's vulnerable. Most of the time, you're probably not even using that component uh, of that library, Therefore, it's not a risk to you. There's no way to exploit it and get to that path. So if you really look at it, 78% of an application is active custom code. So it kind of reverses. It's like, totally, there's 20% is custom code, but th what's actually used is 78%, right? And 22% of that is active uh, open source code. So. We've tried forever, right? You look at this timeline and see all the different things that security and AppSec has tried along the way, the last 21 years, if you will, uh, for the most part. There was a few things before that, but really OWASP top 10, early 2000s, really kind of kicked off the, the whole AppSec thing, right? Way back then, you know, there were a lot of vulnerabilities in apps, about 26 per app on average. And today in 2021, there's about 21 based on the latest data we have. That's not a very big change, and, and the reality is it probably isn't really a change. I mean, that's what, 20% uh, change in 21 years? Uh, that's pretty bad. Uh, you know, it's going to take us another 100 years or more to, to dwindle that down even further, right? Uh, so we're in this thing that we like to call a software security crisis. Um, and I'll explain that here in a second. No. <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, if you want to talk about lines of code and people, uh, give me one more slide and I will definitely get there. Um, so what we, what we have and what we're seeing, and, and this goes into your, your comment, is everything is a software company now. Everyone is building software. Everyone has applications. And they're hiring more and more engineers. And we're writing more and more code. And we're doing it faster and faster because we've got to keep up with you know, competitors and, and get things out there first. And we're writing stuff 10 times faster than we ever have before. The average developer writes anywhere from 10 to 30,000 brand new lines of code a year. And there's millions and millions of them. You start adding all that up, and it's like, holy moly, how are we going to secure all this? We only have a certain amount of budget for tools. We have teeny tiny staff uh, as compared to the number of people writing the code to help secure it. So we're in this major problem, right? Um, we have a problem. So 
the BSIM every year does a study on this about the number of software security group people to developers. Uh, the recent one from last year is there's one SSG for every 159 developers. So people aren't going to solve our problem. They're just not. It's not possible to solve the problem. So why do we want to talk about WAF and RASP? Well, because it's part of the problem that can help solve some of these issues in our software and the, the insecurities that we're, we're creating in them. So I want to talk about what they are, all right? So let's talk about a WAF or Web Application Firewall. Uh, web Application Firewall is something that kind of came to light uh, really early in the 2000, I think it was 2002-ish or something like that when um, you know, we started building it. But at that point in time, you know, it was kind of my first job out of college, we were starting to get really good at firewalls and, and blocking different TCP and UDP ports and all this stuff, but all of a sudden we're building all these websites like telling the firewall network people, hey, open port 443 and port 80, it'll be fine, <laughs> right? So now we have these big gaping holes that we added to our firewalls that we were getting really good at, and we're like, well, what do we do about that? Because we can't really see into the traffic and you know, there's, there's no you know, state viewing type layer seven firewalls at this point. So we were like, oh, well, let's build a web application firewall, right? So Mod Security was kind of born um, to really try to tackle some of the problems of AppSec, um, which really lead into where RASP is, and we'll get to that at some point. And what, you know, what the WAF did is it's able to inspect the traffic kind of like a you know, stateful type firewall would, uh, but at that layer seven. So like I said, what we did is we like, hey, we're good at firewalls. Let's create another firewall that is different. Mod security came along and it's still in use today. I mean, the great thing about that is, you know, it's, it's really evolved. Uh, you know, I think Azure, um, AWS, all them use components of that in, in some of their firewalls, um, you know, and, and it's really served its purpose to the point where we all or should understand that it's not perfect. Um, you know, it's good at certain things, but there's lots of other issues that it may have. So let's dig into that a little bit. So a web application firewall is at the layer seven, so it's at the highest layer. Uh, it's used to stop scanning potential application layer attacks, you know, against our web applications. You know, things like SQL injection, command injections, uh, XSS, it's really good at XSS. It does some things with like DDoS, you know, and, and helps prevent some of those sorts of attacks. Um, from an alerting perspective, it creates a lot of alerts and there's a lot of things going on, probably lots of false positives because there's no context. Um, and then tuning is really a big problem. You know, this CVE comes out or this vendor releases this new uh, bypass for the firewall or, or there's this new exploit and we have to do all this different tuning to, uh, mechanisms to make sure that that WAF is up to date and blocking the latest and greatest exploits and attacks. So let's dig in a little bit how a WAF might work. So what I have here is I have an input field for name, you know, and so I put contrast or one equals one dash dash. Now, those of you that are good at SQL know that this probably would never work anyway because it's probably a string context and there's no, you know, closing off of the, the single quote. Um, but what this does is the WAF sees this. And what does it do? It blocks it. Why does it block it? It says, oh, geez, that looks like SQL. I should block that. But what happens if that never ends in SQL? Right? Maybe that's all just staying on the client side and just populating the name field in a, you know, a, a JavaScript form. Um, so it just blindly says, oh, that looks like it. I run some regex on it. I'm going to block it. So if, if, if we go back here and say, oh, well, maybe it was. Maybe it was a backend calling SQL, right? But the WAF doesn't know that and doesn't care. So if, if we say, oh, well, the backend SQL, and we're like, oh, well, that didn't work. I'm going to try something else. So I'm going to put this in there, you know, semicolon cat Etsy password. What is, what is the WAF going to do with that? It's going to block it. Why? Because it looks like command injection. So now it's blocking two different vulnerability types, two different exploits on the same field because it has no context. Where you may 
be okay with them submitting that. I mean, no, no one's probably called that. That's probably not their name. But, you know, there are plenty of cases where people with, you know, you know, O'Leary or O'Shea or something like that where it's blocking things where it shouldn't because it looks like SQL injection or it looks like something else, right? So that's how a WAF works, which is why we're continuously tuning them and refining them to, to not have these things happen. And then on the other end, conversely, bypass. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I have this terrible analogy, okay? My analogy is almost as bad as Jeff's artwork this morning, <laughs> just <laughs> FYI. But what I'm doing here is, is kind of giving you an idea of how a WAF works at a high level. So this new zoo opens and they have this awesome monkey pen and it has these great monkeys and they created this fence. And this fence is, is smart, it's a smart fence and it's only gonna allow the people there to throw certain things to the monkeys. And so right now it's saying, oh, I only want bananas to go to the monkeys. You know, as the zookeeper, that's all they should eat. You know, that's, that's what we know from Curious George and whatever else, that they're gonna eat monkeys or eat bananas. And so that's cool, but the monkey's not really happy. He's like, gosh, I wish I had a little bit of different things to choose from. So now we gotta tune it, right? Um, you know, so, Tuning is interesting, but you know, determining the attack and determining like, is this a banana uh, or is this an apple and, and is, is crazy, right? And if you think about this, has anyone ever worked with WAF regular expressions or WAF rules? Yeah, you don't count, but you do. <laughs> so uh, it's, there's a lot there and, and there's always tuning needed and, and, I'll, and I'll explain why. So. Uh, if you look at some of these, these are some regular expressions uh, that would be typically seen in, in a WAF where it's looking for certain keywords or phrases, um, you know, based on the type of attack. So you have the window dot open dot location, you know, typical redirect type attack. You have iframe, frame, applet, script, all those things that may be used in some sort of cross-site scripting attack. And then the one that's really interesting to me um, is the on events. On events are interesting because typically they're used to bypass WAFs because there's lots of them. You know, the typical ones would be on click, on error, on mouse click, things like that that you would typically see when performing some sort of cross-site scripting attack. The last time we looked, there were about 374 on events. And that changes frequently because browsers support different ones. So now you have to look at all the browsers and now the WAFs like, oh, I gotta keep updating all this. So you get all this crazy, uh, change that has to come into place all the time because of how fast these things are changing at any point in time. Um, so now the monkeys are like, gosh, I want more things. I don't want just bananas. I want some oranges and apples. So we go in and we got to tune it. And tuning is not straightforward unless someone else is doing it for you. You know, you use the, the AWS WAF or the Azure WAF or something like that that's kind of managing some of those things for you. But for those of you that are using mod security or thinking about it, you have to go in and tune it. So now I gotta change it to say, oh, well, I wanna allow apples and oranges too, and how do I do that, and where do I do it, and what things do I need to tweak to make sure that I'm allowing those? And it's, it's really ugly. I mean, this is one rule in mod security, and this rule is a command injection attack through email. Um, so you have to write this and change the severity levels and really understand what all these different things mean to make sure that you know, you're, you're updating it appropriately because what if you update it wrong and it's detecting a lot of extra things? You're gonna have a lot of really upset people using your web apps because a lot of legitimate traffic's gonna get blocked, right? So it's, it's very critical. It's a critical component of the infrastructure because it can block real traffic. So I made that change, but here's the problem. At what point can that rotten apple still look like an apple? Right, and now I'm gonna make the monkeys sick. It's a terrible analogy, but it made sense to me at the time. I probably had a couple whiskeys deep that day. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's the reality. Um, for those of you that have been in the industry a while, know that WAFs, have lots of bypasses. I, I, every day I go to Twitter, someone's posting, oh, new WAF bypass. Um, it's because it's driven off of regular expressions and they're never gonna be perfect. Um, so common downfalls, you're looking at alert fatigue. You know, it's something that you, I mean, the amount of traffic and stuff that it's looking at and blocking at any point in time is huge. Patching fatigue, 
Over on the right here, um, you can see all of the patches that a customer of ours had applied to their WAF, like in one swoop. Uh, they're like, oh, well, we need to add all these CVEs. And so they got to patch it and, and make sure that they're protected from all these different things because they know they're using those certain components. Um, and then you're, the reality is, is you could be stopping real traffic. Um, you know, early on in the days, I would say it stopped a lot of real traffic. And they've, they've really refined things um, over the years to, to fix some of, those, some of those issues. And then let's talk about the interesting bypasses. And this is just a few. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways to do a lot of things when it comes to coding and, and trying to bypass WAFs. And, you know, command injection is one that's, it's an interesting vulnerability category. And I'll talk about some statistics around that in a bit. But you can see there that some of those, you know, this question marks and the dollar sign, you know, uh, looking for the, the environment variables, which are, don't exist, right? But those things bypass WAFs because what a WAF is, you know, you're looking at that cat Etsy password in the very top. It's looking for cat or Etsy password. It's not looking for ET, some function command that ends up being nothing, so there's nothing there, it's just blank, uh, that turns into Etsy password, right? And then the next one, too, where it's just, it's looking for that single uh, character replace um, that turns out to be bin cat Etsy password. That's bypassing WAFs, right? Same thing with XSS, you know, this really gets to the, the on events and making sure that I've blocked all of them or gotten them and I gotta reevaluate. Every browser update, I swear, it seems like they have a different one that that browser might support. And SQL injection, I think I've learned the most about um, as far as bypasses, but that first one is very interesting. Uh, anyone here a SQL guru? No one? Someone can tell me, what, what is that first one, that slash, star, star, slash, what is that? It's a comment. Yeah, it's a comment, but so there's, so there's nothing in there, it actually results in a white space. So just a blank space, which is what you want there, one and sleep five. Uh, but a, a WAF isn't going to see that because it may be looking for that white space. So there's just all these little tiny things. Man, we, uh, we did some pretty awesome things at a bug bounty and got some awesome submissions like this. We're like, wow, we never knew those things existed. Uh, or the second one, you know, where you're looking at uh, entering a null byte, which a lot of times will screw up any sort of string parser um, and, and confuse it. And those are just a few, but let's talk about one that just recently happened. Anyone uh, aware of the, the recent Confluence on-prem OGNL injection vulnerability? So this is a really interesting one. And I bring it up here because, not because of the vulnerability, but because the researchers who found it had to bypass a WAF in the organization where they were assessing uh, to exploit it. And it, they did it easily. If you look at here, they changed e, the word eval to the Unicode equivalent, equivalent of E with val, and then they had to change the, the single tick to the Unicode equivalent. And just doing that, they bypassed that WAF that that person, it was um, VMware, I believe, that was uh, where they were attacking them. And then they were able to you know, complete this OGNL injection, which basically says, hey, if you're on Windows, run this uh, command.exe, and if you're not, then you know, run the, the, uh, the Linux version of Bash. Um, and it was a pretty big deal. And, uh, you know, it's just one of those things where that organization, you know, they thought they were protected to an extent with their WAF running. And then it turns out, well, the WAF is bypassed, so now, you know, all bets are off. So the last few slides I want to talk about on WAF are about data. And having visibility through that data and how it's important. So only a couple of you raised your hand about using WAFs. Do you use the data coming from them or the alerts? Or do you only go to it when someone reports some weird problem or need to patch it? Could you, should you use the data? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting, right? This is how I see it. You know, for me, I look at the bigger picture, like the, the shift left, shift right, shift everywhere, whatever you want to shift, just shift. Um, you look at it, and, and this, I call this data of the past because there's a lot of things here going on 
where you got some bug tracker data from your SAS, you've got DAS, you've got probably external vendors and stuff, and then you've got your WAF, but there's no correlation between the WAF data and what you've got in your bug tracker, right? And no way to tell like, hey, I've got a SQL injection that I've detected. Do I know for sure I'm blocking it? And if I block a SQL injection, there's no way to tie that back because there's no context. But to me, there's still data that I think is valuable. You know, because if all you're seeing is SQL injection attacks, well, let's prioritize SQL injection issues over the others because that's what we're seeing <laughs> all of the time um, or command injection or whatever it is. But it's, it's, it's interesting because I, I've done this talk a couple of times. I've never had anyone tell me they're actually using WAF data, which is mind boggling to me because there's so much good data there. Um, I'd throw it into a SIM or Splunk or whatever and just see what's there and, and, and look at it and, and see how you can correlate some of that um, moving forward. So that's WAF. So RASP. RASP, I would say it's still very infant. Uh, runtime application self-protection. Uh, it's something that uh, been around five, six years-ish. Um, there's been some people in the market, and I'll talk about some of the, the vendors and stuff here in a bit, um, but uh, it hasn't quite taken off 100% yet. But I want to talk about it because it, it's different than a WAF, um, and, and, and I'll go into that here. So there are some similarities, right? It's, it's a layer seven technology. It's used to stop real attacks, but from within the application. So it's not an external network component. It's not outside of the app. It's living in the actual application. The alert rate is extremely low, low false positive rate, uh, because it knows exactly what's happening, and I'll talk about that in a sec. Um, and it does not require as much tuning, um, resulting in many, many less experts being needed. And really, the, the key parts are vision. Um, it can see into the application because it's in the actual VM. It's running with the application and knows the context of data and the attack and can really determine if this is a valid thing or not. So, you know, I'll talk about, you know, comparing what the WAF did in, in a minute to this. Um, it can monitor to security, uh, the performance, uh, knows exactly when attack is gonna succeed or not, um, you know, and, and it can be enabled anywhere. Anywhere that your apps are running, you can enable this. And it does this by instrumentation. I'm sure you've heard this a few times this week. Um, we instrument everything. You know, every time I think about instrumentation, I think about a cockpit. I mean, the, the amount of instruments that they have in a cockpit uh, especially in the newer ones that are measuring everything for those pilots to understand what's going on with the jet, what's going on outside, what's going on 20 miles ahead um, is crazy, right? Uh, but it's needed. It's needed not only for our comfort level to understand that they're monitoring and measuring these things, but for theirs to know if they have to make a change or divert somewhere else. Um, and I don't know why we haven't thought about doing this in code. We're doing it through APMs, right? We're monitoring performance of our apps through instrumentation, whether you know it or not. So we should be doing it with security in mind too, because you're in the app, you're watching the data, you're watching it flow, and you know where things are vulnerable and when they'd be vulnerable. Same thing in cars, right? Um, this would be a bad one to get, by the way. Zero would be terrible. I've seen you know 15, but but cars are becoming more and more instrumented with different monitors and detections and, and things like that because it's helpful to us to understand what's going on. It's not the pull up to the street light, someone's going like this to roll your window down and then they point at your, your tire, right? Like, I remember that from back in my 16 year old days, um, but we don't have to do that anymore because the car tells us that when our tires are low. And I want my app to tell me that too. I want my app to tell me when things are bad. So let's look at the same sort of attack scenario. So we, we have, the, when we looked at this with the WAF, the WAFs just said, okay, we'll block it, whatever, right? So if this is a backend SQL query, like a SQL execute, the RASP is gonna see this data flow in, it's gonna trace it all the way back to that sync. And it's gonna say, okay, this is actually changing the intent of the query, so I'm going to block it. So it knows the context, it knows what it's supposed to be. It says, this is wrong, and I'm gonna block it. So it has all that context, and then, there's something that can be sent to developers from that. I'm gonna dig way deep into, into the, uh, the way that this is detected in a minute. Great question. Um, 
And so let's go on to the next one, right? Same sort of thing, but now I know that it's a SQL query backend, right? So if I submit this command injection looking thing, it's going to see that come in and it's going to trace it back to the SQL sync and be like, oh, well, that's nothing really for SQL. It doesn't bother me. They can put that in the database. We'll let that through, right? Because it has context. It knows that that's not being executed in a command way. It's not being run on the system. It's just being put into a database. And there are cases, believe me, like this. I mean, I think of, uh, so Contrast is a software security vendor. I think of the way we work. We store a lot of this stuff in our database. I mean, we're getting attack data from customers that look exactly like that, that we have to store in a database. You know, if we threw a WAF in front of the way that the API works, that would be a nightmare because everything would be blocked, right? So for us, RASP is great. All right, so let's dig into to how it kind of does this. So let's look at SQL injection. It's kind of my favorite. And, and the way that it really works is this. So there's, there's two really main key things. It, it has a source. So that's where the data comes in. So we hook that source, and in this case, it's get parameter, right? So on that get parameter, it's getting some parameter from that, you know, from, from here. It's getting the name parameter or whatever it may be called. And it says, I want to track this. I want to track this because it's an important source. I know it's tainted. I know it's untrusted data because it's coming from, you know, an untrusted source. So I mark it, and I want to track this, and I hook it. And then, in the back end, I've marked all of the, the places, you know, where uh, it could go bad. You know, so now that I've marked this, this get parameter of the user, um, I can be like, okay, cool, let's watch this as it flows through the app. Because remember, I'm in the app. I'm living in the virtual machine um, and watching this data flow. And, and then it traces it, it looks at it, it sees it goes through all these other parameters. And I don't really necessarily care about that. Uh, unless there may be some validator involved, right? Um, if there's a validator involved, then I can mark it as trusted or that it's been looked at or validated. But what I really care about is, is the sync or where it's going out, right? So in this case, you can see that the, the sync is execute query, which is a SQL query, right? So it's executing that query. So if I can trace from the source untrusted data all the way into a sync that I've marked as something that is SQL injection sync, I can validate that and say, yes, this is going to be a SQL injection issue. And it gets a little more complicated, right? So let's, let's run through kind of a little test example here. So what I have here is I have just a username and password input. This is like the quintessential early use case SQL injection issue that everyone had. Select star from users where user ID is whatever and password equals the password. So the input is coming in, and, and I'm going to mark both of those, right? I'm going to mark both of those um, sources, the username and password, because they're coming in separate parameters. I'm going to mark them as, as taint or untrusted. And then I'm going to start to break it down a little bit. So if I input the typical SQL query into the username, test at example.com, so, uh, quote or one equals one, semicolon dash dash, what it does is it says, okay, I trace this back, right, because I know it's untrusted, and it gets to this execute query. So before I actually execute the query, I'm going to look at did the intent change of the query? Because I, I can tokenize the query at this point because I know what the query should be. Because I'm in the code. I know what it should be. I'm in the running app. And so if, if I, you know, that select changes, that select statement changes, and there's an extra operation, as you can see, in the or. You know, I can mark that op. Uh, or there's another expression that was added. Um, when all I'm expecting is a string, I can be like, oh, geez, man, that, that's bad. Um, it's going to try and execute something that this query did not intend. So I'm going to block it. Right? So it's a lot smarter than just saying, oh, well, or one equals one looks bad, so I'm going to trace it, and it's going to execute query, so I'm going to block it. It's not always going to block it. It's only going to block it if it's going to change the intent of that, that query. And so you can see here where I've flagged the red, right? So as we're tokenizing the initial or the original query, we can see that, oh, shoot, it added an, another operation of or, and it added another expression of one equals one, and then the comment block. So it basically added three different blocks to the original intent of the query, right? So 
you may think, well, geez, this is a lot of work. And, and, and I'm going to tell you right now, it does slow things down a little bit, right? Because it is doing a lot of uh, validation and, and a lot of things in memory when it's doing things like this. Um, but it's very, very effective and very, very accurate because of this is how it does it. So really, if you look at the full flow, right, you have the untrusted user input coming in, in a source. You have your vulnerable sync called, and in this case is execute query. Uh, and then you see that there's a token boundary crossed here uh, that it was not expecting and not intended, and it's going to block it and send an alert. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. Um, you can do this with Jot. Uh, Jeff Williams is a free version of Jot to do thing, things like this. Um, but it, it's very powerful. And it has so much more context than a WAF would ever have. And it's just really good at certain types of attacks. So if we look at the way we configure a RASP, it looks a little bit different than how we configure a WAF. You basically turn it on or off for the attack type, command injection, cross-site request forgery, things like that. And that's usually about it. The tuning comes into play if you know there's some validator or something in play that's custom or the, the RAS didn't detect or know about, and then you can tune it to add that so you don't you know, block things that you shouldn't. Now, it's not all sunshine and rainbows when it comes to RAS. Like I said, it's very new. Um, and as you can imagine, if it's running in a VM with your code, it's very, it has to be very language and framework specific. And that's very difficult. As fast as languages and frameworks change, um, it's, it's hard to keep up to date. I mean, you know, even point changes on some frameworks, you've got to look at the sources and syncs that you're using and make sure that those are all detected appropriately. Um, so bypasses usually result in code changes. And it's usually because there's something that's changed in the language or framework. It is more difficult to install. Um, you know, it's usually a different team that's installing RASP because it's usually part of the DevOps flow or the infrastructure team that you know brings it into CI/CD and 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 makes sure that the the appropriate Java agent or whatever is installed. Um, and the other thing that's hard for security people, oftentimes you don't see anything. A WAF, you see a lot of stuff, <laughs> right? But in a RASP, you may install and be like. OK, and you might not see anything for days because it's detecting real attacks. Um, and that's the only thing you should see. Um, and that's hard for us for some reason. Why is that hard for us to not see anything? It feels like it's not working, right? It's like, how do I know this is working? But the reality is, is that's how the technology works. So let's go back to Confluence. And this never would have succeeded if VMware would have been using a RASP because of the way that a RASP detects OGL and OGNL injection and would have blocked it regardless of the encoding or whatever that the, the attackers were trying, the malicious actors were trying to do, um, it would have blocked it. And this is just a, an example of a, a dashboard that shows that, yes, that expression language injection event uh, was blocked, the actual payload that the was used to bypass the WAF um, was blocked by the RASP because of where it lives and how it sees things differently. And really, expression language is one of those areas where WAF is not very good at. There's too many of them um, when it comes to Java specifically. And, and a RASP is very good at that. And the reality is, and, and someone I think earlier asked, like, what is RAS? Well, it's already standard. <laughs> it's in NIST 853. It's in PCI. Um, so it's, it's, it's coming. Um, I think if some of the issues can be fixed with performance and things like that, uh, and they will, um, we'll, we'll definitely see it more mainstream. Can you talk about the, like, the memory and the processor? Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, I have a whole section about comparing the, the goods and the, the bads for each, so I'll, I'll definitely dig into that. Um, but I wanted to talk about data because I think data through visibility is important. It's my favorite Dilbert slide. Um, but it looks different. This is kind of data of the future, if you will, where we're instrumenting all of our code and we have a single place for all of the data to go 
I still think a WAF exists, um, but now we have data all the way into production that can be tied back to specific vulnerabilities, right? Because we, we see them, we see the data, the untrusted data flow into the vulnerable sinks. All right, so comparing them, who here, this is hard because only a couple of you use it, have you, have you compared WAF and RASP in your organizations? I like the no because that's, that's the correct answer. But the reality is, is for some reason, and it's changing, for some reason, budgets are for one or the other. So they compare them, thinking they're the same thing, but they're different. And, and hopefully you see that already, and I'll dig into those a little bit further. But so what we did is we're like, all right, well, let's look at some payload testing, because that's what people are doing. They're throwing a bunch of payloads at WAF and a RASP and expecting results that make sense to them. Um, and they're trying to compare those results. So, you know, we had, we had someone come to us and said, here, we did this. We looked at a WAF, we looked at a RASP, and these were our results. What does this tell anyone here? <laughs> but why? You have no context, right? Because um, here, here's the problem. The results really are all over the place. I mean, I don't know what app they used. I don't know what language they're using. I don't even know if the, the attacks that they were sending were on vulnerable components of a, the app that they were using, which make a big deal for a RASP, right? Um, so I can look at this and be like, oh, let's see, we, the, the, the RASP blocked more XSS. That's good, but is it? I mean, maybe, I don't know. I don't have the context. Yeah, which one did you call Yeah, yeah the, so the testing methods are inconsistent. <laughs> and to me, the results don't really mean a whole lot. Um, so we, we dug in a little bit because uh, a lot of folks are like, oh, we need a bunch of payload lists. We want to test all these things. We're like, well, there's lots on the web. You know, GitHub has tons. Um, so we pulled them all in and we're like, let's just look at these payload lists. And I'm going to tell you right now, they're terrible. <laughs> they're bad. Um, XSS, 20% of the payload, uh, payloads in the payload list were not valid or duplicates. SQL injection, about 27% not valid. When I say not valid, they'd never resolve in an actual exploit, ever. Uh, command injection, 48% were not valid. And patch reversal with 82% weren't actually valid. Uh, so they're, they're not only testing them and hoping for the same results out of them, they're testing them with bad data. <laughs> so they're getting these results that are all over the place, and it really hasn't done much uh, other than confuse them of which one they should buy when I believe they should buy both. I think you need both. I'm in security. We need pieces of the onion, and, and we need different layers of control. And I want to talk about that because that's really what the talk is about. So I wasted the first 37 minutes talking about all the other stuff. This is the important stuff I want you to listen to. I want us to use both WAF and RASP. And little tidbits of what I've already talked about uh, is why. Um, so there are a lot of different vulnerability types that are being targeted by attacks. Um, you know, we see around 10,000 plus attacks per application each month. That's a lot. Um, but 99.8% of those attacks target vulnerabilities that aren't even in the application. So those are things that a WAF would probably block um, in some cases, and maybe not, but have no context. And you know, seven time increase over you know this period. This was May to June of this year. Uh, targeted command injection, uh, but the reality is command injection really isn't a problem in most applications these days. No one is writing code that is dealing directly with system commands. Um, you know, and, and four times the increase in applications being targeted by broken access control. So you can see there's all these different attack types, and the WAF is good at so well. The WAF is great at cross site scripting. I'm going to tell you, it's probably better at cross site scripting because. Uh, there are definitely signatures that can be um, in regular expressions and stuff for XSS that are just better and faster. Um, but it's terrible at expression language injection. Um, I would say it's not very good at things like deserialization attacks. You know, you can't really regex your way into figuring out if this is an untrusted deserialization attack. Right, so we have all these attack types, we have some technologies, um, and then we have other data we can look at about like likelihoods, like this is data telling us, okay, well the likelihood of your app to have a SQL injection vulnerability is about 6%, but the likelihood of that app to be attacked 
with SQL injection is about 65%. And you start looking at this, I'm like, oh geez, man, this is, this is some crazy data. Look at command injection. That's the one that always draws my, my attention. 0.3% of apps have the likelihood of having a command injection issue, command injection vulnerability, 0.3%. But 51% likelihood of being attacked by command injection because the payout is so large. Um, so I would take this and be like, all right, well, what is best at some of these? Cross-site scripting, I would 100% throw a laugh at it. Um, expression language injection, even SQL injection is probably better uh, with a RASP. Um, and then you can kind of mix and choose and play with the different things that each one of those technologies looks at. <coughs> and so I always bring up Equifax because it's an interesting one to me, but it's not uncommon. And it's about how fast can we respond? So on March 7th of that year, uh, a CVE was released and disclosed that Apache um, had fixed a version of struts. Um, and then a couple of months later, Equifax, Equifax was breached. So in that time period, what could they have done better? Well, they could have either A, tried to install a WAF and updated it uh, that may or may not have detected this specific attack, or if they would have had a RASP running, they would never have been breached in the first place, right? Um, and the reality is, is I like using them both because the WAF has known bypasses and the RASP is hopefully going to detect those when they're bypassed. Um, but in this case alone, they obviously could not update very quickly. It took them until, uh, you know, basically September to update, right, after they learned of the breach in, in July, which is a huge gap uh, where they could have solved this problem if they were using a technology with WAF and RASP. And there's, there's other ones here, right? right? There's WAF bypasses that could help with the, the, the confluence issue. Uh, I'm, I don't know if anyone saw the, the recent one about the scientific notation bug. There's no way that a WAF would have detected that. No way um, uh, in MySQL left uh, AWS WAF clients vulnerable, which would have been detected and blocked by RAS because it sees the, the tokenization and the context changing. This is why I think we need to do both. Um, I bring up this. How many of you would want to choose a seatbelt or an airbag? We use them both. Why? More better. It's more better, right? You have one for that comfort of the right now, even though it's annoying sometimes if you break hard and it gets locked, you know? And then you have the one for the oh shit moment when you actually hit something and it supposedly helps protect you, even though it may break your nose, it's going to protect you. Um, so it's the prevention and the protection all built into one package, but it's two different technologies. Whereas before, we didn't really have both. Heck, we didn't have seatbelts back in the day. You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> to me, RASP is the airbag. Because it, it only goes off when there's a serious problem. <laughs> right. And the WAF locks up randomly. <laughs> But it has its purpose, right? It has its purpose. You know, one of them may fail. And, and th thankfully, you have both of them. So here's that, that slide where I kind of contrast and compare the two. Uh, because I do think that they work very well together based on their, e their strengths and weaknesses of, of each of them. You know, your WAF, you have alert fatigue issues, false positive, false negatives. Patching and tuning gets to be a lot. There's no actionable results. There's really nothing you can do other than validate that yes, traffic was blocked and I need to change something. Um, and it has no context data uh, when it comes to that. RASP has really good strengths that compare to those weaknesses. It's very accurate and to the point where there's often no results. Very little tuning retire, uh, required and there's gap coverage while WAF is patched. Uh, actionable results uh, showing the exact code path that's vulnerable, so now I can action it. Uh, and then it has a very, very good context and application aware data. And so if we look at the RASP weaknesses, it does have performance impacts. I've seen anywhere from zero to 10%. It just depends on that application, how, how much memory it's allocated, how old it is. I mean, there's just so many factors because it's very framework and language specific. So there is definitely a performance impact uh, when it comes to RASP. 
Um, it's very language and framework specific, uh, which means if you've pulled down struts or spring and totally pulled it apart and wrote your own, it, RAF isn't probably going to be the answer for you, unfortunately. Um, it's not environment aware, right? So it's in the app. So anything that happens before that, it knows nothing about, um, which sometimes can create problems. Uh, bypass fixes typically do require an application restart, which sometimes people don't like as well because you got to pull in the new agent, get that loaded, get things re-instrumented. But the WAF, on the other hand, has some strengths to counteract some of that. Performance is not an issue. So if you get the WAF looking at the things that it can do better, DDoS protection, XSS, you know, maybe some CVE patches that are like immediate. Um, it's language agnostic. It doesn't matter what language that your backend is using, right? It's more environment aware because it's at that layer. It's outside of the application. Um, and patches are applied to the perimeter and there's no app restart. So I do think that they work very well together. Um, you know, they complement each other. Uh, I think we should be using them both in cases where we can. Um, you know, just understanding how difficult it is for us to secure an application environment. Um, I, I love these in, in, uh, in line in a production environment to help pr protect from the application weaknesses that we know exist. We know we're developing and deploying code to prod that have vulnerabilities. We know it. Um, and you know, if, if I just had a WAF there, I wouldn't be comfortable enough to put that in prod, um, but having both would, would help. So there's a lot of vendors in this space. Uh, I love AppSec Map, by the way. I'm a CISO, I look at it all the time. I'm always looking at different products and different things. Um, it's got all the different types of AppSec tools you can think of. Um, and uh, here are just a few of the WAF and RASP vendors that, that are available out there today. Um, you know, I definitely would, uh, would take a look at them. If you're not using either of them, I highly suggest finding one to use <laughs> first and getting your feet wet. Um, but uh, that's it. Um, that's my talk. Questions, comments? Yeah. Um, so would it, would it be true then um, a WAF you could put in front of multiple applications mm -hmm. where the RAF would be one to one? Not quite. So think about it this way. So uh, for those of you that have like an IAS Microsoft environment, you may have a server that's running 50 applications. You can install one RASP agent on that IAS server and it protects all the applications in that VM, if you will. But with an, uh, a WAF, you may be able to put that in front of your entire environment, you know, way outside if it will work for you that way and protect everything. But whatever's in that VM, so a lot of uh, Java uh, customers have lots of apps in a single VM, it will protect all of them, the RASP would. Yeah. Only if you have the authorization in the code. No, the, you don't have to change your code at all. Uh, that's the great thing about RASP. Um, so I always use Java because that's the one I know the, well, the, the best, but th there's a, a Java agent, so it's a JVM parameter. You just link it to the RASP agent and it automatically loads it when it uh, loads the JVM and your code is automatically instrumented. So you're not making any application changes. Yeah. Um, what other language findings? I mentioned Java quite a few times. Yeah. Like C sharp or anything. Yeah, yeah. So, well, I, I mean, I only know we have some RASP, RASP vendor, but uh, Java, .NET, .NET Core, Go, uh, Ruby, Python, and Node. Uh, but uh, there's more coming, I mean. And then as a follow-up, like if you're using something like a containerized environment, you have like a service router that sits behind like a load balancer on the WAP, is that where you would integrate the, the RASP? Well, the RASP has to be running where your application is. So like if you're using Kubernetes, you know, inside of the pod or whatever, it, it's part of the VM, wherever your application is running. Like where's that running? We see it used a lot in microservices too, where it's instrumenting the microservice itself. Um, but it has to be running where the actual app is running, wherever that may be. So where you're running the Java virtual machine, right? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you? Is there an AWS appliance for the RASP? Like, can you just get it off Amazon? Or? No, there's not because you have to actually, inst that's why it's a little harder to install. You have to install it with every single application, right? Or every, I don't want to say every application, every virtual machine. Even containers? Yes, even containers. 
So uh, land is an interesting one. Um, I haven't. Uh, we're looking at like creating a, a layer um, that would do all of that and instrument in that layer. Um, and I think that's probably the right approach for that. But I don't think anyone's doing that today. Great question. Anyone else? Awesome. Thank you.